Well, thank you both for joining me here today. So we're here to discuss neuro rights, but before we talk about that, I want to first talk about what neurotechnology is in the first place. Um, there's been a wave of new devices that are both uh, medical, can treat disease like deep brain stimulation, for example, which is actually an implant. But there's also more consumer grade technology, wearables that, uh, that you can sit on your head like halo neuroscience, which purport to uh, advance your physical capabilities and even you know uh, help you learn new things. So, uh, I want to start off by talking about how both of you define uh, neurotechnology in the context of neuro rights. Rafa, would you kick us off? Yeah, so what is uh, neurotechnology? So this is very simple. It's technology that can record the activity of neurons in the brain and that can change the activity of neurons in the brain. And this technology could be electrical, it could be electrodes, chips, it could be optical with lasers and cameras. No? It could be magnetic with magnets and scanners. No? Uh, it could be there are uh, ways of doing this type of thing with uh, chemically, molecularly. Uh, and why is neurotechnology important? Well, it uh, has to do uh, with President Obama, 2013. He launched the US Brain Initiative. It's a large scale project, 15 uh, year purview to build new technology, uh, and this is a project that's now involving 500 labs around the country and the world. Uh, estimated funding is gonna be about $6 billion, and it has been copied or has stimulated similar programs all over the world. And uh, this is over exciting uh, for all these reasons, but it's a serious uh, ethical and societal issues because the brain is not just another organ like your, your liver or your, your kidney happens to be the organ that generates your mind, okay? So everything, all your cognitive abilities, your um, perception, your memories, your thoughts, your imagination, your behavior, your emotions, it's all generated by these neurons. So if you can record and change the activity of the neurons, you can read and write, you can in principle read and write the minds of, of, of people. And this is not science fiction. We're doing this in laboratory animals already successfully. So this will happen. So what I would love to talk about is with both of you actually, because um, obviously this technology has huge opportunity to, to do great things for humanity, but also obviously, as you said just now, there's some ethical concerns. What technologies to you are the most concerning? Uh, and John, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, many technologies are concerning. I mean, just to be very clear, what we're talking about here, as Rafa said, neurotechnology is when you get under the skull. In other words, when you get to the brain, either to read and write to it. Nevertheless, many technologies can actually affect your behavior. Um, we've been trying to control people's behavior for millennia. Uh, that's what propaganda is. That's what fake news is. That's what commercials are. That's what your iPhone does. So there are many ways to, in a sophisticated manner, control people's minds and their behavior. What has changed is that the technology now can get under the skull and actually get to your neurons. So the issue is, is whether that technology is going to be the best ever so far in controlling people's behaviors and minds. Um, but there are Many others, as we know from the social dilemma, that you can use sophisticated psychological techniques to get people to buy almost anything. Um, but again, maybe in the limit, getting under the skull is the most concerning yet. And Rafa, would you agree with that? Is that, is that the getting under the skull is the most concerning aspect of this new technology? Yeah, exactly. I completely agree. Uh, it is, uh, again, because we're dealing with the brain now uh, and the brain generates the mind, this is the first time in history that humans can have direct access to the contents of people's mind and uh, can change them. Uh, so uh, there's something very important that uh, we should highlight is that um, there's a big difference between receiving information from the outside that's trying to manipulate you because it still goes through your senses. You can still, you see it through your eyes and you still know that this is something from the outside, it's, it's foreign. No? and you may agree or not agree with you. The problem with neurotechnology is that the minute that uh, you change the activity of the brain directly, 
the brain interprets that, you interpret that as yourself. And we know that already from uh, patients that have uh, deep brain stimulators, for example, or, uh, or some primitive brain computer interfaces, people that are paralyzed, they interpret these commands as their own volition. Because, and, and no surprise there, because since the brain is generating your, yourself, no, your, your consciousness and your, your behavior, if you change the brain, you're going to think that that's you, no? Because it's the same. It's tapping into the same mechanisms, and that I think it's a it's a line we should not cross. I think uh, many of us are worried about the power of te- of this neurotechnology for these reasons because um, this is not again something from the outside that you're going to be uh, alert to. This is something that you will interpret as as your own. Self and um, yeah, and that that has never happened before in history. So that's why I think we have to uh, to uh, to think very carefully about how we're going to bring this into society. And part of the reason for this is because this technology or some of this technology is not already covered by existing laws, like HIPAA, for example, where there's a clear medical implant. You know, there are privacy rules around that kind of technology, but not all of that fits within this, not all of this technology that we're discussing here today fits within that scope. Um, So in 2017, Rafa, you brought together a group of around 25 people uh, to form the Morningside group um, and to hash out some of these ideas and also um, perhaps come up with some policies um, that you might put forward. And so you did come up with some ideas around how to protect someone's neuro rights. And I was wondering if you could just briefly discuss that. Oh, yeah, it actually happened right here on this floor on uh, the Morningside campus of Columbia. That's why we call ourselves a Morningside group. And uh, I'm just a representative of that group of people that includes uh, experts in AI coming from the tech industry, from Google, uh, people from you know, technology companies, uh, researchers like ourselves uh, that are building these methods, people coming from the clinic, neurosurgeons, bioethicists, and importantly, representative from all the brain initiative from around the world. And we hold ourselves up here for three days and uh, thinking about all these ethical challenges of neurotechnology. And our position is that this is a human rights issue uh, because uh, neurotechnology has the potential of altering the same mechanisms that makes us human uh, it should be thought of uh, within a human rights framework. And we propose new human rights, which we call neuro rights, as if it were brain rights or, or the rights of the mind of people, that to be added to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Huh? And this, uh, just very, very briefly, these neuro rights would protect mental privacy so that the contents of your mind will are protected, your own self, your identity, so that it doesn't get manipulated. Your own decision-making, your sense of agency should be protected, your free will in a way, and also should guarantee fair access of neural augmentation. Uh, We haven't talked about that, but these technologies can be used to augment the cognitive, sensory, and mental capabilities of humans. And the last neural rights is the protection from bias uh, in the algorithms that are used Neurotechnology and AI are, are sort of mixing. So all of this is a package. So that was our, our proposal. Uh, we coined the term neural rights and, uh, and we've been actually uh, advocating for these neural rights in different uh, countries uh, and with different international organizations since then. John, you've pushed back a little bit on the idea of focusing on neuro rights explicitly, um, just in terms of there are existing technologies as you were discussing earlier, Um, artificial intelligence that is already manipulating people's minds. Um, I think probably everyone has seen the social dilemma at this point, and so we're very aware of the role that social media plays in in people's cognitive functioning and mental health. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that position and and why you think that maybe we should be paying some attention to that as well? Yeah, I mean, I I think I was not pushing back so much as, as worrying that you know, brain machine interface and, you know, getting into the brain has enormous, um, has a very big emotional salient effect on people. Um, it, it appeals very much, particularly in the United States, to our techno-utopianism, right? We, we believe in the U.S. in particular that there's a technological solution for everything. You know, in some cases there are. 
Um, I think we're already seeing, the social dilemma pointed this out, all sorts of very worrying manipulation that has huge ethical, it raises huge ethical concerns. Um, so I, I wasn't against anything about neuro rights, just I, I wish we'd been better at mind rights uh, before we got here. Nevertheless, you know, I believe that if we can get neuro rights uh, and do it well, then maybe we can sort of roll things back and apply that to mind rights. So I think, you know, it's the notion of the genie is out of the bottle in one case, let's make sure the neuro one doesn't get out, right? So I'm... Uh, um, the other thing um, I would say, and it worries me, and I'm of course a believer in human rights and medical regulation, I'm a neurologist myself, um, is that I sometimes worry that we believe that anything can be tried because we have no idea what might happen. Um, and the only way to deal with it is to regulate it rather than perhaps never do it in the first place. You know, and Prometheus and Faust, many examples. So the other concern I have is just because you can do it, should we do it? And is regulation the only way to prevent unforeseen consequences? Um, but, you know, on top, you know, all that said, you have to start somewhere and neuro rights will be perhaps the best chance of getting it done before it's too late. Yes, absolutely. And Rafa, you've been talking about how a lot of this technology is already here. You've also talked about, um, the, about this concept of sort of working in mind rights. Would you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so just recently we had a, 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 we hosted a meeting online on brain computer interfaces, a whole day of talks in which uh, uh, we heard uh, some of the world's experts coming from academia, from uh, also from the industry and people experts in data security and experts in in ethical, in your ethics and ethical uh, and societal regulation. And I have to tell you, I was just blown away by the progress that's going on. I mean, I, I, I not try to keep up with what people are doing, but it was just amazing. Both uh, uh, what they were showing us from the academic laboratories and the industry uh, makes this issue even more urgent, you know, because we are not that far from devices that could be released that enabled you to do a relatively low resolution brain scan uh, that could then be used to decode some basic uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, traits or basic cognitive uh, states that, that, that you have. So, uh, yeah, so, so this could be a good opportunity to rethink uh, the whole uh, technology uh, as uh, uh, regulation as uh, something that should be framed within the human rights uh, framework. Now, I think the human rights, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, they're not perfect, but this is the only piece of paper that most people in the world agree with. <laughs> Everyone has his own uh, religion and their own political system, but the human rights is something that ties us all down, or at least most of humanity. And it is what defines uh, what is a human, so uh, the, the, the rights of a human. So I think this is a neurote neurotechnology and the neuro rights could be in a way at the spearhead to try to open up the discussion of human rights, uh, which, you know, the Universal Declaration was launched in 1948. It has not been touched since. The world has changed a lot since 1948. And uh, it's just not perfect. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are on the table now from... Uh, essentially the, the internet, the social networks, neurotechnology that has changed the rules, the genetic engineering. So we have to rethink uh, who do we want to be as a, as a society, you know, and uh, approach it, I think, from the human rights perspective. That seems to be the most fundamental way you could do that. You know, it's interesting. I think that, you know, you have rolled out this sort of medical framework for talking about neuro rights um, and thinking about it within a medical context in terms of reading and writing neural activity. But to John's point about sort of AI and um, propaganda, fake news, et cetera, all these things that also do manipulate the mind, I do wonder how we begin to attack that problem just because it is not so, I don't think it so easily fits into a medical framework. How do you think we begin talking about that? And either John or Rafa, please jump in. Well, I mean, it's, it's actually interesting. In other words, um, it's a very interesting idea to, to have a more of a medical regulatory view of all those things. But, but the pressures have been in the opposite direction. In other words, many of the companies that Rafa's talking about 
they dangle the carrot of medical benefit, but what they really want is a consumer platform. Okay, I mean, let's be very honest, that's what's going on here. So the, the problem is, is that a lot of companies don't want to be subject to medical regulations. That's why they like the idea of consumer platforms. Um, so under the surface here is what happens when you have rampant sort of neoliberal capitalism where everything goes and it's going to be a challenge to turn around and say that that rampant consumer impulse should now be brought under medical regulation. Um, so I admire the ambition and I agree with it. And maybe this is the tip of the spear, as Rafa said, uh, but it's going to be difficult because deep down what people want is consumer technology enhancement and medicine is just the sort of moral carrot, I sometimes think. Rafa, will you tell me just a little bit about what countries are already looking at uh, neuro rights and incorporating them into their... Yes, so, um, so there's a progress in Chile. Turns out about a month ago, the Senate of the Republic of Chile introduced a constitutional amendment to Article 19 of their constitution and a bill of law for neuroprotection. And there, for the first time, uh, they define mental integrity as a basic human right that cannot be manipulated. And uh, it, they define, uh, for the first time in, in legal terms, what is neurotechnology, what is a brain-computer interface, what is brain data, and apply to it the medical model, the existing Chilean medical code and uh, the Chilean uh, laws that regulate the donation and transplantation of organs. So this, this uh, is now in, under, undergoing hearings in the Senate. Uh, there is bipartisan support for this uh, constitutional amendment and this bill of neuroprotection. Uh, the president of the Republic uh, is behind it, but also the, uh, the left-wing parties are, are supporting it. They're initiating it actually. So it's likely to get approved, and this could be the first time um, that there's a country in the world where these things are actually regulated. There's also progress in Spain. Uh, just this, uh, very recently, uh, the, the uh, um, state secretary for uh, AI, which depends, uh, which is directly under the vice president of the government of Spain, uh, launched uh, the Charter of Digital Rights, uh, which are now in public hearing. So any citizen of, of Spain can, can send feedback on this uh, uh, digital rights, which is essentially, it's a little bit what we're talking about. It's a human rights, a new set of human rights for the digital era. But part of this, this uh, charter, actually the uh, chapter 24, it deals with uh, new technology and they essentially incorporated the, the neural rights uh, into it. So this could be uh, also pioneering uh, efforts in Europe. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me and for this really rich conversation. And back to you in Portugal.